The words best game ever are ones that get a lot of scrutiny. Like we'd have the greatest minds in the world arguing about whether you can even say that. Socrates would be up there complaining about the lack of good debate, and then Plato would walk up with a smoke bomb shiv combo. Is The Last of Us the best game ever? No, that can't exist. But it is a mixture of a very beloved game with an impressive level of artistic depth to it. Which is to say that a lot of people like it and call it their favorite game. So if the term can mean anything, maybe it can mean that. One of my biggest addictions in the world was re-watching the gameplay demo for the original Last of Us. Listen, I was 12, I could have been on DeviantArt. It is one of the most atmospheric 15 minutes I've ever seen. The game was beautiful, showing a lush version of Pittsburgh long after nature had reclaimed it. Its two protagonists, Joel and Ellie, talked and moved in this realistic fashion. I saw this, right before the outbreak. He did? Does he totally gut her by the end? With these open combat arenas where you could alternate between stealth and shooting, as they find themselves in a scrap with these bandits, all of which would realistically call out the player's moves if he had a gun. He's got a gun! He's got a gun! How many people were with him? How many are there? I'm a shot one! Whether they could flank him. Hey! Go around! Joel would collect crafting materials that allowed him to make deadly weapons. No! No! The player's companion, Ellie, would make these dramatic plays and organically react to the violence. I'm here. I'm right here. Oh, God. Then the trailer drops and you remember that it was being developed by Naughty Dog, who were hot off the heels of Uncharted 2, Among Thieves. The best game of all time. Okay, I'm starting to see your point. All of these things are technically in The Last of Us, but in a way that doesn't feel like this gameplay demo. Half the animations aren't there, the characters only have like three lines for combat, stressful moments actually just look like Joel flickering around and swinging at the air, plus half of you looked at that list of features and went, no thank you. Because really, I have also described most of the mediocre games to come out in the last generation. Like Joel whispering, not, not a fucking, fucking word, would be put into the DNA chain and Darwin would give us Frey Holland. Except The Last of Us came out and it was very good. So much so that it got re-released a bunch, got a sequel, got cancelled on Twitter, then it was revitalized by the TV show, or as far as this YouTube video is concerned, the TV show shrunk it down, flipped in with a blur on it, which frankly, people really wanted to hate, like truly hate. People were thrilled with the idea of hating this show. And finally, only to make my life harder, a remake that is prettier, but the same game. So I couldn't use this copy or this copy, I had to spend $70 to evade three YouTube comments. I can't tell you everything this game has to offer. That would be, well, insane. Plus, let's be real, you already know what happens. I'm going to walk through the game's levels, talk about some curious bits in them, and comment on the things I think are interesting. What the hell would a guide on The Last of Us even be? Don't craft the melee weapon upgrade? It's about as useful as George Carlin at a self-help motivation seminar? Though I also am way too far gone for this to be a review. This is like my eighth time playing this game. It can't be magic anymore. All I can do is give you the experience filtered through the lens of a big dumb idiot. So sit the fuck down, we're going to play the best game of all time, subjectively, for the time, with respects to the idea that any game can be- The Last of Us opens on the day of the apocalypse through the eyes of a little girl named Sarah. Her father, Joel, comes home on his birthday, and she gifts him a watch. She says she paid for it with hardcore drugs, and that line always puzzled me. But the older I got, the more I realized that her uncle probably just gave her the money. Suddenly, in the middle of the night, the same uncle calls you up searching for your dad. You'll notice that this game is amazing at setting up its environments. You can see all her favorite bands on the wall, the way the TV lights up her father's room, you see an explosion on TV, then notice it out your own window. And as you creep through this house, this sense of anxiety starts to weigh on you, as you slowly realize, I did not see this girl on the box art. Things quickly unravel as Sarah, Joel, and the brother Tommy try to escape as people become infected with a disease that causes them to act in strange and aggressive ways. It's based on an actual thing called cordyceps, a fungus that infects your brain and takes it over. Present in ants, but The Last of Us aims it at humans. Like this neighbor over here, your dad takes his first life and you get to watch. Quick note, there will be spoilers in this as we go through, incrementally more, so uh, let's talk about the graphics. Specifically how they use it to kill your main character's daughter in the opening with the coldest attitude possible. We're going to talk about this scene later, so we're going to take a minute to assess it here. Joel and Sarah approach a military guard who is coordinating people from the outbreak. They're especially thankful as he just gunned down the infected chasing them. The man takes a moment to check in with his superior. We don't hear what his boss says, but he briefly objects. 
before being talked down and raising his gun at them, opening fire on the pair, sending them down the hill. He looks at Joel ready to finish him, but at the last moment, Joel holds up his hand and the shooter hesitates, giving Tommy a chance to blow his brains out. Then it reveals that the soldier shot Sarah, and Sarah just turns off. She doesn't even understand the pain. She doesn't have time to think about what it means. She suffers for a few seconds, then there's nothing. And as Joel holds her tight, you can see that the fall broke the watch. The game then hard cuts to 20 years later and Joel lives in Boston as a smuggler. And he is fucking miserable. Dude has a permanent frown every time he sleeps he has nightmares and he has one friend in his life. A little more misery and he might know what it's like to be a minor with ADHD. He's greeted by his partner in crime Tess who says that a person they want dead is around so we're gonna go out and file him under dead. The start of the level is a slow burn. It's a ton of exposition, and if you really need to say it, it insists upon itself. A lot of it is how the infection has affected the world. Most people live in quarantine zones controlled by the military, who uses a fascist level of scrutiny to ensure cordyceps don't make it into the zone. But on the bright side, they did turn Boston into a walkable city. Soldiers hoard the food with a system of ration cards, and you work on a rigid schedule with a curfew that determines when you can leave. You might not like it, however, you only kill three infected in the whole town, so at least it's working. 90% of the gameplay in The Last of Us is walking around with a party member, taking in the scenery and solving small environmental puzzles while grabbing some loot when you can. There's a compelling weight to just sitting in these spaces. Even when there's genuinely nothing to do, you can just pause and you'll find a picture. The rest of the Boston level is fighting people. Combat in The Last of Us is a classic third-person shooter with a side of melodrama. It's more complicated than it seems, but nothing overwhelming to master. It's characterized by its focus on resource management and the interactions with the AI. The enemies in this game are beholden to an invisible system called the Balance of Power. If they think you're a threat, they back off to give you space. If they sense you're weak, they dive in. Joel at this point only has a tiny pistol, his fists, and a bottle if need be. Those other two will come in handy because reloading in The Last of Us is about as rare as seeing someone smile in it. You need to count your shots, either hit them in the head or use stealth. If you run out of ammo, you can shuffle through a doorway to lose your pursuers. I wouldn't recommend running at the enemy. There's a modifier to their accuracy. Normally they miss you, but if you try to walk up to them, they'll stun lock you to death. Also, I'm playing on hard. Survivor and Grounded are the super hard mode for the kind of people who think using a gun is for pussies when a nice bottle is right there. The challenge is nice, though I like to have some fun. Editing Steven is probably happy that he's not cutting around 500 shots of Joel getting killed. And I wanted to make this video in a short amount of time, but that didn't fucking happen. Holding this single gun also means that you don't need to worry about looting. You'll almost certainly find something useful in the environment. That is not something that we can say for the later levels. We find the stray guy on our list and Tess girl bosses two bullets into his head. The deal with him is south, so in lieu of that, the pair strike up a deal with the Fireflies, a group of revolutionaries that want to restore the government to how it used to be, or at least the parts that they want it to be like. Now we meet Ellie, a 14-year-old brick pouch, and our new best friend. Joel sees this and instantly recedes into the coldest attitude he can surmise. But what's Ellie's deal? Well, she's immune, and if they can take her out of Boston to the Fireflies' home base, she can be used to engineer a cure. Now Joel, Tess, and Ellie have to make it through the next level, the Boston outskirts. This is a portion of Boston that the military hasn't claimed yet. They will search some of it for escapees who they will shoot and kill, so I don't really know why they're even bothering. More cream donuts for everyone else. I mean, they did kill some people, but hey, they're due a fair trial. The game also rains here. They look the same on the PC version. I'd feel bad about the PC players who have to play a shitty port, but I also want to laugh at them for falling for it yet again. The financial district gives us two big additions. The first is the crafting system. From this point, we've mostly been able to walk around or do that slow waltz thing I do for the camera, all the while grabbing ammo, parts, or the odd health kit. But now, Joel is collecting ingredients. Once you have a full circle of ingredients, they can be used to craft, which you need to hunker down in your backpack in order to do. At this point, we have two options, a health kit or a Molotov cocktail, both of which use the same two ingredients, a full thing of alcohol and rags. Both of these items are self-explanatory, which is why I'm going to do it right now. The health kits are your primary way of healing. You need to stay stationary for a moment to apply it, but it will cover up, uh, what's it covering up again? <laughs> the only other method of healing is in these rare food drops. The Molotov cocktail is a tiny explosive which kills most things it hits. This creates a perplexing dilemma. Would you rather create the only source of healing in the game, or would you craft Kill Person? And Joel has Kill Person with this, this, this. Okay, this isn't actually that big of a deal. Two reasons. Firstly, if Joel is severely hurt for a long time and out of options, Ellie or Tess will give him a medkit. 
I don't have footage of it though because I didn't play this game 8 fucking times to be pampered by it. The second is that infected are drawn to the sound of fire, which means they'll run into it and burn themselves to death. The Molotov can be thrown from cover without exposing yourself, and while it will certainly surprise them, it won't break stealth on human enemies. It's actually decent value, but if the other option is spending the entire game bleeding, seems like an easy compromise to me. Now the game gives you a new gun, the revolver, and drops you into a zone with infected in it. While it's not a significant amount of them, a lot of new players find this part unnerving. First off, because the infected are still an unknown, and secondly, this is the first time the player is actively alone. Tess has been backing them up for so long, now it's just you and two pistols that do the same thing. The first type of infected are runners. These are people that have been infected for a short amount of time. They've lost their ability to reason but kept their motor skills. They sprint at you, then flail for a short amount of damage. They're frail, but in stealth, they're sensitive to spotting you. A single one can be dispatched with a melee combo because Joel punches to win. Each strike will normally stun the enemy, so as long as you get the first blow, it'll combo into a kill. In a group, they will corner you, which makes you vulnerable to the next toy the game pulls out. The clickers. These are the main infected enemies in the game. They've been infected for a very long time. So the fungus has taken away their sight, but they've gained echolocation through clicking. This means that they are very vulnerable to sound, and you can walk right in front of them without being spotted unless they start clicking. Clickers kill you in one shot on contact. By the way, yes, this is the only clip I have of it. And yes, this is the last infected fight in the game. And yes, I was this close to saying I was better than you. Many of the infected sections in the game are easier to stealth. Human enemies seek you out and spot you when you least expect it. But because of the clicker's blindness, you can simplify things to just the sounds you make. One broken bottle on the other side of the map, and some duck walking will do things over. If you were to ask me to rank the levels in The Last of Us, I'd say the levels with an infected priority always go a bit lower than the human ones. You know what, screw it, here's my tier list of levels. Do you disagree? Type out something in the comments, then don't actually say it because you're wrong. Wait, wait, I, wait, actually I need your attention. I, I, I want to connect with someone. Joel has the ability to choke someone out from behind. It's quiet and lets you save resources, but you can't do this to clickers. You need a shiv. These are craftable with a full thing of duct tape and blades. Shivs kill quickly, but they break just as fast. The problem is that shivs are also required to open certain doors. They're optional, but inside you will find a large cache of ammo, crafting materials, and gun parts. Thankfully, there's another way to deal with clickers. See these bricks over here? The chapter as a whole is tense. The dilapidated building you go through doesn't come off as a game level. It feels like someone actually thought of what this building would be like after 20 years. Then also put a bunch of stuff players can shimmy on. The Last of Us and Naughty Dog in general are famous for their signposting. They use film tricks to predict where the player's eye will be. Your party will usually follow the golden path and climbing something usually signifies the end meaning you know the optional areas versus the ending ones. You never walk past a shiv door, you go, maybe I shouldn't have wasted that on a clicker. Because if this was a real building, Tess and Joel would be running into dead ends left and right, then be buried alive, dying a slow death without even Homer Collins to talk them through it. After being in the building, you move to the subway system and a museum. It's a compact, dark, and uncomfortable station. You can hear the infected, but you can't tell where they are. They click at you in the dark, and if you get attacked, you're going to get surrounded. If you're going the extra mile, there is a side quest here. One store has a safe, and another has a combination to that safe. Once the infected find you, it's hard to lose them. Opening this safe comes down to staying in stealth or killing all of the infected. If I'm being honest, the main thing stopping you in stealth is the runners or not knowing how to push the stick lightly. I don't even mean that as a jerk thing. I used to hate moving the stick slowly. It goes against my instinct to throttle the thing. But then I learned if I'm gonna have the record button going the entire playthrough, I better get those fucking scenic shots. Then you have the museum, where I start to notice that everything in the level is breakable. Joel gets separated from Tess and Ellie here and gets set upon by more clickers, just in case the first time wasn't panic-inducing enough. When you reunite with them, Tess gets a suspicious hug, but it's okay, Joel is the romantic type. We reach the Capitol building where the deal was supposed to end. We drop Ellie off, go collect the reward. Except no, the Fireflies aren't very good at shooting people. They're just good at planting bombs and running away. So new plan, we're gonna take Ellie around the country to Joel's brother Tommy, who at some point became a Firefly. Tommy will then use his connections to point Joel and Ellie to the Fireflies. The big issue is that Tess can't come. She's got the hug disease, so it's just on Joel. Tess basically bullies and guilts him into undertaking this. She desperately draws on their relationship. This scene is one of my favorites because you've been with Tess for a long time. She's helped you through Robert's Wharf, through the military search zone, through this shattered building, 
through this dinky subway station, through this museum. It's not just a friend that is implied. She felt like a main character. A group of soldiers shout from outside and Tess says she'll hold them off. But what she intends to do is die by their hands. There is no holding them off. You're going to have to shoot your way out of here anyway. You don't even witness Tess's end. You just sort of see her body a few minutes after. Joel finds a rifle, which opens up the conversation on weapon swapping. Joel can carry one long gun and one short gun. Short guns being the pistol and revolver, the long guns being the rifle. He keeps all of these in his bag somehow. The player needs to pause real fast to bring it out. It's not so bad as you're only swapping out your handguns at the moment. Which do the same thing. A loud shooty bang that ends family lineages. The pistol kills in three hits while the revolver does it in two. The trade-off is that the pistol shoots faster with a higher ammo count. But you're ducking into cover so often that reloading is a non-issue. Revolver is the way to go. It feels like butter because of the PS5 controller. I can't wait for Ellie to carry it in the second game like it's a sentimental tool of justice when Joel just pinched it off some dude. The rooms they ask you to fight in are very large, and they only get larger from here. These soldiers start at the end of these long, long rooms and slowly sweep to the end, so you can start your approach from wherever you want. Stealth is advised, but you knew that. You knew that the second you got excited for an ammo drop and it didn't even fill your clip. Soldiers also carry armor, which will eat up a bullet or two. Your aim has a natural sway to it that intentionally makes it more likely to miss. Thankfully, the throat cuddle doesn't believe in bloom or armor. You escape through the subway station, and Joel, reeling from the loss of his friend, basically tells Ellie that he hates her and that she shouldn't speak. We need a car to get all the way to Jackson, so we need to talk to Joel and Tess's old partner. Bill. Generally, I like the human levels over the infected levels, but Bill's town gets a pass because it's fucking beautiful. It's like looking at some inspirational Instagram photo. The original game was pretty stunning for the time, but even I have to admit that the remake of The Last of Us is next level pretty. Setting this whole level during the golden hour makes the whole place feel oddly welcoming. This could be your town, the next town over, some place you stopped by on a long road trip. The opening street has this calming energy to it, especially in contrast to the previous level killing off a main character and throwing you into an intense shootout. You can check out a garden, a record shop, an arcade. At this point, Ellie can't really connect with Joel, and he's still a little mad that this plan got his only friend killed, though he's not outright hostile with her. The game is full of all these little moments between them. There's an infected presence throughout the town, but it never comes off as something that ruins the atmosphere. Despite Joel's wishes, Ellie continues to speak. I love the way the game portrays Joel's resistance. He always picks the quickest, shortest words to end the conversation. He's not rude, just avoidant. Yeah. Those are gnomes. Man, I had an art book filled with these. I always thought they were super cute. <laughs> Not fairies, though. They creep me out. All right, man. Upon the way, we find the next craftable item. If you have a melee weapon, Joel can attach a blade to it so that its next strike is an instant kill. Also, melee weapons. Melee weapons can be picked up and replace Joel's fists. It's not super complicated. Each one has a certain number of uses. When it's done, it breaks. Outside of the durability, the only difference between the melee weapons is that the machete and the axe are one-hit kills. And this can help you kill those clickers. Their face has a layer of fungus that absorbs a hit, and they're less likely to stagger from gunshots. Think of them more like rabid pit bulls. You wouldn't want to punch them or let the child handle it. Swinging a melee weapon keeps space from them without having to use your revolver. Or, you grab a brick again. The melee weapon upgrade is the money sink of craftable items. It costs the same stuff as a ship, and I'm not walking past those fucking doors. Maybe on a lighter difficulty I'll feel more comfortable knowing that the duct tape and scissors will be around. But on hard, and just barely knowing where everything is, I'm struggling to get through. Each level pairs Joel and Ellie with a new character. And this level's companion character, Bill, is really interesting. He's Joel's isolationism taken to its biggest extremes. He's pushed away the people he cares about. Anyone new has to put up with a bitter layer of sarcasm. And if all else fails, he put bombs everywhere. But like Ashton Kutcher at the end of his character arc, he does know where to get a car. It's on the other side of town, so you need to climb through the infected. In order to do this, Bill gives us two new toys, a shotgun and nail bomb. The shotgun is the best gun in the game. Oh man, that's right. In my myopic tiny experience in this world, the shotgun is the best gun in the game. It kills the infected up close with a single blast, and for the infected, the only range they have is shotgun range. Even at a distance, it can nail enemies in the legs to stun them. The only problem is that it's not very good before being upgraded. The recoil is really strong and the fire rate can be problematic. Each gun in the game can receive upgrades at these crafting benches, with those massive hordes of parts you've been gathering. Because we're on PS5, they all get a nice little animation when you do the upgrade, or you roll the dice. 
Sometimes Joel will do something that makes complete sense, sometimes he rubs dirt on it. While we're on the topic of the PS5, this shotgun feels crazy in the new controller. I'm not a PlayStation cuck, I don't want to sell this to you. It's a waste of money and God of War Ragnarok was really forgettable. But, if you did get the money together for it, I, I don't know, check this shit out. Lincoln has sprawling infected sections. Good thing you now have nail bombs. By mixing an explosive and a blade, you can make a trap. It can function like a Molotov, thrown at a guy you don't know when watching him become vapor, but it can also be laid on the ground, then make them vapor when they walk past it. It's my favorite craftable. I won't say if it's the best ever. I will learn this lesson for a little bit. I'm more of the trap setting type with this. Bill and Ellie have been fighting the whole time, so they're not gonna watch my back for me. Eventually, you guys come across the body of Frank. Apparently in the show, this is a much deeper relationship than Bill pissed him off so much he would rather die. Bill refers to Frank as his old partner. He got bit and chose to take his own life rather than succumb to the infection. Bill is clearly upset about this, and you can find a note in the house from Frank that says, I hate Bill so much and I would rather die. It's actually the player's choice on whether or not they give this letter to him. This is the result of Bill's actions. He will be alone now because he was so paranoid. Should you give him this letter that tells him it was a mistake or keep it to yourself? It doesn't influence anything. It's not like a moral choice. Frank's got the car we need, so we just gotta go and take it. It does need the battery to charge, resulting in one last fight. He will grumble and be bitter the entire time, it's just, should he know? Is this guy really the type of person that would gain anything from this letter but anguish? Is not knowing even worse? Does it even matter what you think? The final section is what I call a bullet sink. With The Last of Us being so dependent on ammo management, there's parts where they just say, screw it, here's a bunch of ammo, go shoot it. The section here has no stealth option. You need to keep running back to the car to push it. No subtlety is possible. You can conserve resources by not missing, but that's it. It's exploding clicker heads all the way through, and why did that sentence sound kinda racialized? After the car section, Joel tries to connect with Bill. Not to hold on to anything or take him with, just to say that he knows what it's like and Bill reaches out for half a second. He gifts Joel with a gas siphon and an acknowledgement that their deal is fulfilled. We square. We're square. And get the fuck out of my town. We never know where his story goes from here. Personally, I think he died a few years later setting off his own trap. Maybe something better happened, but I would rather just not know. What follows is a scene where Ellie gloats about stealing Bill's dirty magazines. Honestly, great scene. No notes. You also find out about Ellie's interest in comics. And you know, it gave me the confidence to say that her favorite show growing up would have been Ben 10, and Bill really would have liked AI the Somnium Files. We run into a traffic blockade in Pittsburgh. Joel goes deeper into the city only to find a wounded man who joins the party by splashing splattering against the hood of his car. Though I don't know if the people of Pittsburgh should be shooting at Joel. If he slips once, he could level a city block. Pittsburgh has become a tourist trap. People who enter the city are killed by the denizens and looted en masse. There are certain checkpoints where the men are stationed, attempting to funnel roamers in. That's what Joel and Ellie walked into, but Pittsburgh didn't realize that I'm fucking crazy. This gas station fight is iconic to me. Bill's town marks such a long period of shooting infected. It's a sigh of relief that you're fighting human enemies now. To blast people and have them say something back. To know that they actually fear death. The hunters are here to vacuum all of those resources you didn't spend on that last fight in Bill's town. Afterwards, we get our last craftable item the smoke bombs. They're self-explanatory, so let me explain them to you. You throw these and they blow up in a massive puff of sugar that blocks enemy vision. It also stuns them in that explosion, allowing you to take hunters hostage or finish them with a melee attack. This also destroys the crafting economy. Thus far, each craftable has had two options, Molotov and health kits, alcohol and rags, shivs and melee weapons, blades and duct tape. Except smoke bombs break this convention. They should share the same things as the nail bomb, except nail bombs require an explosive and a blade, not sugar. Sugar only goes to smoke bombs, and smoke bombs are the last craftable in the entire game. Sugar goes to one thing, blades go to three, which is why I always have too much fucking duct tape. On another note, Pittsburgh is the best level in The Last of Us. It's the longest, which helps, but it's got so much going for it. There's a large diversity of encounters. Sometimes it's an ambush that you could completely skip. Other times, Joel is in a basement surrounded by infected, in a town square with the help of a sniper, watching tripwires for bombs, evading spotlights at night. All of the combat encounters in this level are awesome. It kicks off with this tight shootout to this boomer music, then transitions to this bookshop fight. Dude, y you don't even know. This bookshop is massive. There's an outside, a bottom floor with tight corridors, and upstairs with a big 
big open center, there's a noticeable difference with how this game builds its infected and human encounters. Infected levels are tighter and smaller, while these hunter shootouts are way larger and maze-like. I'm not a Naughty Dog designer because I don't have that kind of value. My guess is that Joel needs to get cornered to get killed by the infected, while humans need to whittle him down with gunshots or flank him. Most players won't understand all of the routes in every arena until around their third playthrough. Pittsburgh is also really fun to loot, because crafting in this game is so simple, grabbing stuff isn't a chore. Yes, the sugar economy is fucked up, but there will never be a thing you pick up that doesn't have a use. Like you'll play Forspoken and I don't know what the hell I'm gonna do with this, but a thing of scissors? I know what I'm gonna do with that. And then it moves to this series of hotel rooms and oh shit! Two floors and it's a big maze. Let's talk about the AI. Enemies are trying to hunt you down from all angles. Shoot Shootouts are more akin to paintball. Instead of popping out of cover and absorbing as much damage until you drop back down, it's tactical. Getting hit stuns you, so there's no trading shots. If you expose yourself at the wrong time, Joel's going to get hit so that you can't fire back. Hunters only shoot when they have a bead on you. So often, they'll approach you with their weapon drawn, hoping you show your face. If a bunch of guys are looking at your cover, you need to be really fast or wait until they're not aiming at you anymore, then sprint off to flank them. There's also your bombs if you want to even things out. The same rule applies to you. If there's one dude hiding behind cover, there's no harm in aiming at him until he pops out. Can we also talk about the violence here? Maybe not enough to scare my boss. Human enemies get annihilated in this game. The animation department went crazy on this melee system. For something as simple as spamming square and occasionally pressing triangle, it comes off as so much more because of how it feels. Joel will slam his enemies into the environment for contextual attacks and every strike always has a meaty thwack to it. In a way, that old gameplay demo is like seeing Joel through Ellie's eyes before we knew his trauma or saw his mistakes. We get this badass that knows how to survive. Merciless, but also moves in this sort of gritty John Wick with a John Brick kind of way. Sadly, if anyone has both played the game and seen this demo, you'll know the AI isn't nearly that complicated. There's some good stuff they've got going on, but not on this level. Near the end of that video, there was this really cool bit where the last enemy realizes he's alone and unarmed so he starts hiding from Joel, lurking around corners and kiting him around, eventually ambushing him with a Molotov cocktail and trying to rush him in the confusion. He fumbles it, but the attitude was awesome. The Last of Us Part 1 for real uses voice lines to make them feel more authentic, but they're beyond complex behaviors like this. For example, they can describe where Joel is hiding with a variety of lines like, he hid behind that desk. Though that won't result in a character adopting a new route, they simply hold the same attitude. Melee-based enemies will try to minimize exposure, letting their allies pop shots at you and staying in cover when you aim at them, though that's something they always do. Is this to say the combat is bad? No. Just that Naughty Dog is capable of pulling a Ubisoft. The big key in the AI is actually Ellie. The game is trying to build a bond between them through the gameplay. Like when you're not killing people, she'll say stuff like, I bet if you get that plank we can cross. But combat is where she really shines. Ellie won't trigger enemies during stealth to purposefully make sure that she's nothing but a benefit to you. Like sometimes she calls out an enemy, which puts an icon over their head. If you get grabbed, she can switchblade an enemy to free you. I'll cite the lack of footage under the not garbage clause. Or, most infamously, she'll lob a brick at a bad guy to stun them. The outcome of each shootout will rely on your aim before it does hers, but every time she does help you, it feels like the game adding a new reason for you to like her. Like, look at her here. I'm healing and she's watching an angle like we're defending on Oregon. Speaking of which, eventually Joel does give her a gun, after she shoots a hunter that was attacking him. This scene is really interesting to me because Ellie has a very strong emotional reaction to it. She says she feels sick and takes a moment to sit down, though it all vanishes the moment Joel chastises her for getting involved with that fight in the first place. She blows up at him, gets mad, but the fact that she got so upset so quickly with Joel for not being proud of her makes me feel like she didn't actually feel all that bad about the actual killing. 14 year olds are monsters, but I also don't know how much Ellie's brain can actually contextualize that murder. This journey has already led to a lot of people just like this guy dying. I think she knows she's supposed to feel bad about it. However, her fixation going straight to Joel gives me the impression that slaying this person didn't matter. It's that she made such a personal stride that he didn't acknowledge. The game then cleverly makes you go through the dining area of the hotel in silence, which leads right into the next scene where Joel changes his mind and lets her use the rifle. It's like Joel knew he was wrong for pushing her away in that moment, but needed a minute to walk around and play the piano before actually saying it. Ellie's going to test out her newfound violent self-actualization by providing sniper support in the next fight. Before she was just chucking bricks and handing out ammo, but now Ellie 
Ellie is actively trying to kill the enemies with you, which can be useful when you're pinned under fire. And the encounter for where this happens might be one of my favorites in the whole game. You start from stealth as these three guys gossip. You can move in so many directions from there. Reinforcements show up and it almost feels like Uncharted. Joel gets so much thrown at him and, I, and I'm sorry, I recorded all this footage and it looks so fucking good. Pittsburgh's hunters have a culture to them. They're the capital of a dog-eat-dog -dog world. Originally, this place was just like Boston until the Fireflies came in and helped the people wage a bloody war against them. However, once the military was gone, the Fireflies were unable to set up a new, proper government, leading to the people then chasing them out of the city too. So now, without the military supply networks or their rules, they had gained access to a swath of weapons with a desperate need to use them. Because of that, the Hunters are ruthless. They hang people who steal, kids aren't kept around, and they're, I don't know, trying to kill anyone who walks in? Yet you wouldn't know that by listening to them. They're all pretty friendly with each other, talking about politics, people they had to hunt, bacon. You're not supposed to feel bad about killing them, but you are supposed to think about how these people exist as more than hoodie dudes between you and a vaccine. Their main goal seems to be looking for clickers, either to clean out the danger or loot areas that haven't been found yet, and clickers would be a good indication of that. They also refer to people who enter their town as tourists. Though I don't know how they can tell what's a tourist and what isn't. You guys don't have a uniform. It's just whatever hoodies you looted from the Gap. I don't know if this was desperate asset reuse, but while scavenging a building, I saw a wanted poster for Marlene, the main firefly we met in Boston that hooked us up with Ellie. Which means she might have been a part of the Firefly sect that put these hunters in charge. Meaning Marlene has a great track record. Midway through the level, we finally meet the two new cast members, Henry and Sam. Two siblings who are also looking for the Fireflies, but stumbled into the same trap. And yes, this cutscene is how they met. Oh, man, you hit hard. Man, well, I was <laughs> trying to kill you. Henry and Sam are foils for Joel and Ellie, Henry being Joel and Sam being Ellie. There are differences, but the main theme of being a protector comes up multiple times. The difference is that Joel is way more negligent. Henry has a rigid system of rules for Sam to follow, but Joel's only rules were, don't hurt my feelings. Henry consistently chastises Sam and creates this anxiety in him. Sam doesn't understand and doesn't want to listen. However, Joel's avoidant personality that Ellie has been constantly chasing means that these two somehow have a a healthier relationship. We also have a party of four, three of which are armed with guns. I feel like it was a missed opportunity to not put in a massive shootout similar to the financial plaza, where you could feel truly backed up by the numbers you've amassed. There is combat, though it's a handful of goon shootouts with static cover rather than some giant street with multiple buildings. The best you get is this final fight as the four of you break out of Pittsburgh through a gate. The Last of Us is sort of realistic, but it's okay with throwing a bunch of stuff at you, like making you run away from a minigun turret before jumping into a river to escape the city. I always feel a bit sad about leaving Pittsburgh behind when I replay this game. The whole segment is a great rush with so much variety in it. While the rest of the levels are beautiful in their own right, they're also shorter. Of course, if we want to get to those levels, we gotta go through what all PlayStation 3 games had. Sewer levels. And we still have so much video left. Oh man, that's a lot of video left. Editing Steven hates you. Thankfully, this video is sponsored by me. I didn't have anything today, I'm sorry, but I have a Patreon. I post works in progress on the video, and you get your name in the credits. With a video that's spiraled into being as large as this one has, the support from people like this goes a long way. It's in the description, no pressure, but hey, if you do, I appreciate it. I ranked the sewers as the worst level in The Last of Us. Even at the lowest point on my tier list, I still think it's a decent level. I just have to say that something is the worst, and a series of smelly-ass tunnels is a good fit for that. The sewers were converted into a settlement. A man came off his boat and decided to believe in humanity, to turn these sewers into a home for him and travelers he came across. It was supposed to be hopeful, like, oh, you know, there's still love in the world. Anyway, now you blow apart their infected husks with shotguns. It also has one of the three stalker segments in the game. The first one was in Pittsburgh, but we don't need to go back there. Stalkers are the middle stage between runners and clickers, where the infection has made them like clickers, but without the armor on their face. So they can still see you, and they do. 
Stealth isn't an option against stalkers because they are hiding from you. They crouch behind walls and go for a quick flurry of hits then run away. I know that sounds like it's from Prey, but it's not that complicated in practice. They usually take cover in a way that lightly exposes them. Joel can blow them away from there if he wants, and even then the shotgun has this weird habit of dropping in packs of six. But if you fuck that up, they gave you a second one just in case. The whole level is a bullet sink, and I just don't think there's a lot to do outside of solving puzzles. I feel like it's a pretty cold take. The rest of the game is still like beating people with a stick and committing super cool murder, and it's an important beat to give the characters time to actually know each other. It's just that all of the levels we've been through so far have had such awesome lighting tricks and been a pleasure to look at. Now it's just Joel's flashlight. And by now the combat's losing the excitement a bit. As Joel gets more guns, the game starts to spread its ammo for each individually. So by the end of the game, instead of counting your six revolver shots, you have two revolver shots, one hunting pistol shot, one shotgun round, half a mag of rifle rounds, an arrow for good luck, and five seconds of flamethrower fuel slowing the pacing down and making things less exciting, especially when you scavenge for ammo to find shotgun shells, then shotgun shells lowercase. I like this brief part where you get separated from Ellie, and you have to deal with Sam instead. Ellie's been through stuff. Sam's a wet blanket that watches you get Zerg rushed without helping. There's even a bit of comedy as you all escape, only to find a sign that says, don't go in there, there's miserable remains in human form. Things do perk right back up when you get to the suburbs. You bumble through this tiny street without any threats, giving you time to gather a boatload of supplies and spend it on casual conversation with Henry, Sam, and Ellie. Each house tells a small story. Something I love about this game is how it feels like there's zero asset reuse. There is, I found it, but you could almost be fooled into thinking it doesn't exist. I'm sure the guys who stayed up until 5 a.m. designing some bedrooms feel great. He's thinking about how he could have put one teddy bear on the bed and called it a day. But you genuinely could spend a good five minutes in every room staring at things, trying to imagine the kind of person who lived here before. Look, there's even annoying dogs in the neighborhood to bark late at night. As we walk out, we get sniped at. This guy and his gang have the whole street locked down, but he has a real radio voice. The dude can shout all the way down the street without ever stressing himself out. I record like 15 minutes of audio and I need a stiff and a painkiller. There are two major paths, left or right. Left takes you to a burnt out house and right takes you to these nice little cabins. The game lets you pick and crossing this street is a bad idea, leading to you getting locked in when you first pick a direction. Once you get up there, you give the dude his last surprise, then you get to snipe people. Something I noticed is that these probably aren't the same hunters as before. I think this is an outside faction that is at war with them. There's this offhanded line by a few hunters where they say their boss was thinking of expanding, and someone replies, I've heard that expansion talk way too many times, and every time we try, it ends up with a bunch of us getting killed. On first hearing about this, I thought it was the infected, until I heard the sniper say a line like, This ain't your turn, man! And after we kill him and start sniping, we get attacked by a truck we previously saw in the city. I don't think they're here for us. We escaped through a sewer, I doubt they were tracking us. So what I'm imagining is that this sniper opens fire on Joel thinking he's a Pittsburgh hunter. Then the machine gunner truck shows up thinking Joel is this outside faction. And in this love triangle, I fucking win. Maybe that was obvious to a lot of people. I just realized it now and thought it was kinda neat. Or perhaps it was all nonsense. Just felt like putting it out there. We escape to a local radio tower. Eat chili, count the canned peaches. Sam, out of the blue, asks Ellie what she thinks the infected are. And it kind of made me think about it. They're not dead, just mind controlled. These infected are probably still the same people, just with animal instincts and less brain capacity. She tells Sam for no reason in particular that there's no heaven. It's okay, when I was 14, I said that now come was a metaphor for obsessive compulsive disorder. The next level is a local power plant. Tommy is stationed somewhere in the area and he can point us towards the fireflies. The game is split into seasons, believe it or not. All of that from before was summer, now it's fall. And Joel jumps into freezing water to get a pallet. Henry and Sam, don't worry about it, they're not on the box. Joel and Tommy's relationship soured while they were in Boston. Tommy had grown weary of killing people to survive and hoped for a better future, but Joel can't see it that way. So Tommy joined the Fireflies, and at some point then left it, though he couldn't completely drop his optimism. So he left Boston and the two ended on the words, I don't ever want to see your goddamn face again. The moment we walk up to the power plant, we're immediately held at gunpoint by Tommy, but it immediately diffuses once he realizes that it's his older brother. This moment is really sweet. 
Despite Joel's relationship with him ending on bad terms, the moment is portrayed as a relief and a reunion. Instead of a standoff, all of that anger washes out because it's just so exciting to see someone you love again. Everyone talks about The Last of Us's music by Gustavo Santanala, but this one track has always had its way of warming my heart. Holy shit. <laughs> How you doing, baby brother? God damn. Yeah. Let me look at you. Tommy sells you a story almost too good to be true. He and his wife have founded a community with its own electricity. No infection problems and no fascism. Still walkable, too. He's so happy and content here that when Joel asks him to take Ellie to the Fireflies in his stead, he's like, What? I'm not doing that. I can start watching Netflix again. Bandits then storm the building, letting you get a good shootout with Tommy. It's cool that you walked through this space without any stress, then it gets reused as a lengthy battle arena. The whole place is armed with people on your side. I don't really think you need them though. This shootout has a uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven dudes here. I've killed that on my way to pick up the new Harry Potter. I can't prove it, but I'm pretty sure the AI in this game is more effective when you can actually see them in action. <laughs> Ellie or Tommy will never score a kill unless you are directly looking at the enemy and need their help. The only proof of this is the clips I have, but also the fact that I never seem to be missing a body when it's looting time. I know where every single one is, and maybe Ellie is just an attention whore. Upon realizing that Joel wants to send Tommy with her in his stead, she steals a horse and rides off waiting to get found. And I was right, she is an attention whore. Ellie learned about the death of Sarah through Tommy's wife, which made a lot of wires connect in her brain. It's okay, you get to ride around on a horse though. I've never ridden on a horse before. I have a feeling that's a thing for girls that are too successful to settle, but too boring to ruin your life. I forgot about the supplements. We could talk about it right here. Ellie's gonna be fine, she's reading. She's in her environment. We're doing two sponsors today. Alongside parts, you will pick up supplements. Joel doesn't seem to care what's actually in these bottles or if they expire. He just eats that shit like Popeye. You can spend these supplements to unlock traits on Joel's person. Unlike weapon upgrades, there's a tab in your backpack that lets you make these upgrades. The traits you can upgrade are your max health, listen mode distance, crafting speed, healing speed, weapon sway, and shiv master. I don't normally upgrade the healing or crafting speed, because unlike the rest, these feel like very intentional parts of the game design. Upgrading it so that Joel can assemble bombs in a second would take away from the tension in combat. Plus, it's not even that long. If you're in cover, they'll leave you alone regardless of what that weird hissing sound is. Shiv Master allows Joel to break free from a clicker's grab with his shivs. Oh, what? I'm not garbage, so I don't use this. I've neglected to bring up the listen mode, but it's really simple. If you hold a button, the screen goes gray as Joel focuses his hearing. The enemies appear as white silhouettes when they make noise. Upgrading the distance on listen mode is alright, I just prefer to max out my health first. Maybe mess with the weapon sway a few times too. Okay, random supplement sponsorship over with. When you find Ellie, she's reading some random farm girl's diary. I don't have any comments on the writing in this scene. I think it's pretty apparent. This is the scene where Ellie directly brings up the Sarah thing. You can feel the events of Sarah's death in everything about Joel's character, but it's never been directly brought up until this level. I kinda want to talk about the acting. Troy Baker is basically a menace at this point. You can't sit on a whoopee cushion without his Texan accent leaving it. However, I'd be lying if I said he was a bad actor. He's got that really cool Max Payne gravel to his voice that can also keep itself rooted in reality. You have no idea what loss is. Ellie's actor, Ashley Johnson, brings more of a rash confidence to her, not someone that thinks much about the future. She's smart and curious about the world around her in a way that brings out its beauty, though she also makes choices without thinking. It feels like this scene was directed with theater in mind where they're acting in competition with each other. Ashley Johnson is like the opposite of Troy Baker. She brings herself to a very small amount of projects, but knocks it out of the park every time she does. Also, the bandits in this level are coming in pretty clutch, because every cutscene, Joel is about to ruin his relationship with the only two people on Earth that still like him. Then they show up out of nowhere and he bonds over killing them. And I shit you not, this solves the problem both times. Joel says, okay, I'll keep you, Ellie. We'll take a horse to the Fireflies. Tommy tells you where to find them, the University of Eastern Colorado, leaving the implication that when they're done, the pair will return to Jackson to settle down. Man, I hate university. All you did was steal my money and tell me that I wasn't good enough. 
The university level is an interesting one because you can see some things that Naughty Dog would want to explore in later games. As you ride around on your horse, Callus, stopping periodically to check corners for loot and notes. It's not as expansive as, say, The Lost Legacy, but I'd call it the baby steps. It's probably where Joel and Ellie's relationship gets the most amount of payoff with casual conversation and a massive story beat that happens later. The university isn't that bad unless you're on a replay of the game. Sure, you can reassess the writing and find new dimensions to it, but I'm also sick of shooting fucking clickers by now. A lot of this section is Joel and Ellie wandering through this university looking for the fireflies. The mystery of where they are and what happens here mostly carries it. On a replay, it's like, okay, monkeys killed them. Why am I still fixing generators? The first portion is a few infected set pieces, probably some of the more underwhelming ones. There is an awesome one where you're skulking through these empty dorm rooms surrounded by spores, clickers, and an abomination. Though the other one is a library with runners that go down quicker than JFK in Team Snipers. You probably noticed that I haven't spoken about the two guns we've gotten since then. I've made fun of the shorty a few times, but there was the El Diablo, which is just rifle lowercase. The game breaks this by giving us a fucking flamethrower. It's really good against runners and stalkers, but maybe less so against clickers or whatever this thing is. Something that always bothered me was that the runners are supposed to be recently infected, but this university has been abandoned for a while. They're behind a locked gate and everything. So how did these guys get infected? Joel and Ellie do not find the fireflies here. What they find instead is the funniest thing I've seen in my life. There's a dead researcher after being bitten and infected by his own creations. He sat in the lab all alone and died here, spending those last moments recalling what he can, drip feeding it into a tape recording all of his life culminating in a long audio diary, and Joel hits fast forwards. Thankfully, at the end of the tape, we hear exactly where we need to go. Joel and Ellie need to get to Salt Lake City if they want to claim that rebate. What they find instead is strangers trying to kill them, so the pair need to backtrack through the building. Sadly for these guys, I just found the last tool I needed for a fully upgraded shotgun. And its ammo tends to drop in packs of six. Just for context, here's the shotgun at the start of the game. Here it is at the end. Here's Joel at the start of the level. Here's Joel at the end. The following level has to star Ellie because of this. Ellie plays almost the same as Joel. The key difference is her melee sucks ass and she has less weapons. You have to rely on the bow and rifle. Ellie also doesn't have the supplemental upgrades that Joel did, making her very frail, especially in the health department. Ellie is just trying to get them back on track. She's trying to get food, medicine, and resources, leading to this hunting portion where you have to track a deer. And guess what? It's kind of difficult for the first time. The game doesn't tell you Joel's alive. I'm just a bastard who likes spoiling things. However, that means that the game cuts from Joel falling off his horse straight to this. New character, new scenario, which is like, no, take me back to that. Then I realized that this sentence is Neil Druckmann's favorite thing. The key character in this section of the game is David, a struggling man that runs a local settlement. David is, well, I can't say what David is without getting in trouble, so I'll post a certain someone, flip him, and put a blur on top. The arc of the level is to basically shatter what's left of Ellie's innocence. David attempts to do the same thing Joel did, earn Ellie's trust, something she might have excitedly accepted at the start of the game, but her journey with Joel is giving her a newfound sense of cynicism. However, he keeps a gentle disposition to him. He's always polite, he keeps his deals fair, and he even fights with you as you both get swarmed by infected. It's almost a bastardization of what the game did with Ellie. While she helps Joel in combat to encourage a bond between her and the player, David helps Ellie out, but then you learn that he was behind the men from the university, revealing that between him and Ellie is a pile of bodies made out of his friends. Then he explains that he wants to take Ellie under his wing, show her a better life in his community at the town of Silver Lake, or, as one of his men will later put it, make her his pet. Ellie, for some reason, does not see the diplomacy in this, but it's okay, he's gonna take that rejection lightly and have his men track her down so that he can kidnap her. David is voiced by Nolan North, and oh, that's nice! You bring Troy Baker to Uncharted and he gets to be the charming but flawed older brother. Nathan Drake comes to The Last of Us and they give him the cannibal creep. My favorite detail is here. Ellie's in this lodge and gets ambushed by two guys. Once you kill them both, Ellie attempts to exit through the front door but is knocked out by David. However, he comes from inside the building, which implies he was there with these two men, but the moment Ellie showed up, he hid so that she could easily kill them and he could take her without hurting her. 
Wow. There's this one section where Ellie is alone without her weapons. The whole set piece is chaotic. There's a massive blizzard raging on. You can't see anything. Every other combat arena I know by heart. I can tell you that if you get to this cafe over here, there will always be a small thing of blades behind the counter. I have no idea what to do here. I just know that I have to keep running forwards, and I don't mean this is a bad thing. It feels like you're running from something, that you're alone and afraid, just blitzing and trying to make sense of any of it. This does mean that you don't get a sense of the Silver Lake encampment like you do with Pittsburgh. You get a note or two about their culture, the two notes being, they like to eat human flesh and sometimes they talk shit about David, but they're just guys in beanies, really. Maybe that's for the best, though. The winter section is really short, but it also feels like a very necessary part of the game. And I don't want people to get too excited about killing guys in beanies. Ellie's melee doesn't stun like Joel's does. So melee combat for her is like breaking a Minecraft block. Joel eventually does recover with a single shot of penicillin, which leads to him taking some stragglers behind. This scene might be one of the best at showing Troy Baker's emotional range with the character. Joel's killed in self-defense before, but you've never gotten the sense that he's taking his time with it. To him, violence is something that you have to do. But when it comes to torturing these men, it's painful and slow. He even kills this guy that poses absolutely zero threat to him. Now you're back with all your weapons trying to find Ellie in the town. Thankfully, she's doing a great job on her own because Joel has no plan here. When you were Ellie, you always felt like you needed to keep moving or you would get killed. But Joel is allowed to be slow and methodical. I love the way the barrels of fire act as this source of light. It's small, but it creates such a unique look. Eventually, he comes across a burning steakhouse. Inside, Ellie is locked in with David. He's got the keys and a loaded revolver, but Ellie has her switchblade and stealth, so actually David is locked in with Ellie. I know that sounds interesting, but it's time for something completely different. DLC. Naughty Dog doesn't do normal downloadable content. They basically make tiny other games with the existing mechanics, and Left Behind is a prequel story about Ellie taking place before she met Joel, when she lived in a military school. Despite having played the original more times than I can count, the DLC for The Last of Us, Left Behind, I've played twice, one of them being for this video. It's a tale of two malls, one with Ellie and her friend the day she got infected, and another where she's looking for the medicine to revive Joel. And I couldn't stand it. When I was a kid, I was super bored with Left Behind. Not because of any political reasons, don't worry, we're not gonna make the Matt Walsh pivot. You spend so much of it walking around with said friend without anything to loot. It starts to dip a bit too far into the walking sim portion. The DLC only seems to flash forward to the present with Ellie killing David's goons, because without this there would be zero action. You can't just inject lesbianism. Ellie needs to have made us relate to her by feeding a man to a zombie, or have her throw bricks at a car. So much so that I was debating skipping this section entirely, if it weren't for a few bits I noticed on the replay. The DLC is short, and I'd probably have eaten this shit up in another context. There are some nice details, like how the outfit Riley wears is what Ellie wears in The Last of Us 2. I never was a 13 year old girl, but there's a certain awkwardness to the writing that makes it feel genuine. You can even do one of those weird photo booths. What's a Facebook? Maybe it prints our faces in a book? Then you have the Ellie combat in the present. While no new items or weapons are added, you do get to fight human and infected enemies at the same time. You throw a bottle and watch as David's boarding group gets swarmed. Ellie also seems to weigh pretty lightly on the balance of power. The AI is really eager to run up to her and practice their Muay Thai. I probably died in this last fight more than I did anywhere else. The player needs to defend Joel and Callus from a series of human enemies, but the position they put you in is terrible. All three routes will have dudes come coming from them while you get a tiny piece of cover that is under the watchful eye of a sniper. Usually you get out of this in a scenic way where you toss a bomb or work in the chaos, but here you just need to fucking take damage then run until you get a stealth opportunity. Let's actually talk about the final boss of the DLC, the Riley water gun boss fight. You both have a soak meter that slowly fills as you shoot each other. If you step on any plates, she'll hear you coming. Depending on your difficulty, her aggression will increase. You need to sneak up from behind to get a backstab. With each one, the playing field changes. At first, she uses a gun only. Then he pulls out a machete to chase you, alternating between the two depending on your distance from each other. Thankfully, the AI is stupid and the area is really big. Hell, if you just step on the plates, then kite around real quick, he'll show his back for an obvious hit. 
making it kind of easy to catch your predator. You get forced into a series of quick time events as she pulls behind her head for the machete. Ellie then violently murders David, like she mauls him up, dude. Grandma, I hit the share button, what do you think? As Ellie gets a bit too into it, Joel shows up to take her out of there. Ellie sobs covered in blood and Joel calls her baby girl. The first time he's said that since Sarah died. This is the culmination of both of their character arcs. Neither of them will change or grow after this point. The game is still going, but this is who Joel and Ellie are now. Ellie has absorbed Joel's view of the world and Joel has something to fight for. After a brief exchange, the music drowns out what they're saying as if it's not important, taking us to the final season, Spring. Salt Lake City is the slowest portion of the whole game. There's only one fight squished near the end, and it's an infected encounter. It's also the final fight where Ellie and Joel will be together. Overall, it's really nice. The spring energy brings a good lens to the level. The large amount of abandoned space is shown for the sake of showing it. I marked this against Left Behind, but at this point, it feels earned. I want to walk through an Instagram photo for a bit. Plus, this is like the only time Salt Lake City has ever been used in a video game. Let them have this before we blow up New York for the 500th time. There's also this feeling that I've never really felt before in a piece of media. I can only describe it as being at the end of a very long trip, where there's no reason to be sad but you feel sad anyway. Everything's fine, the people you care about are fine, but you just feel so weird about knowing it's over. You don't enjoy that last ride, that last expensive dinner. You feel like time stopped, that you need to appreciate it while it's here, but that emptiness is gnawing at you. Then there's a giraffe and that's kinda neat. You can see the hospital that was detailed by the university guy. So you need to venture through this tunnel and you're there. Except here's where that final infected section is. The main thing is that you have to deal with multiple bloaters, which most people probably won't have the ammo for. I always stealth this section. Do you want to know what the bloater death animation looks like? I bet you don't. We've been fighting these on and off throughout the game, but since infected talk stops after here, the bloater is a good way to go. Hell, I didn't even tell you its name. You knew it. Bloaters are mortifying, scarier than clickers. Bloaters have high amounts of armor, kill you in one shot up close, and lob bombs from afar. Since you have the gun, which is mightier than the spore, Joel can run circles around them, though it exposes him to the other infected. They have three special fungus bombs on their chest that they can lob at you. If you shoot them, it'll do big damage to their armor and remove one of their weapons. Said spore bombs will deal damage over time while you stand in them, forcing you to move again. They are vulnerable to fire as it rots away their armor. Then use the big eraser. But that isn't to say it's easy, just that you have options. In fact, I'd say pretty confidently that this is the hardest section in the entire game. Left Behind's final fight is tough, but it's also sorta short. If you get past the bad starting angle, you might be alright. If you get caught here and aggro the entire tunnel, you will be constantly overwhelmed. Barely able to stand still for a second, trying to scrounge around for just enough bullets to kill the blood. Loaders. The final, final fights are tough, but they're human enemies. And for as much as I talked up how I like them, if I'm being honest with myself, the infected are tougher. Infected being on your case leads to you using your guns and attracting even more while human enemies will forget about you if you just don't pop out of cover for a minute. Crafting and healing becomes tougher because of the pacing too. You need to be careful about what you use because you might not get a chance to restock it, even down to when you reload. I don't even know if Naughty Dog expected you to kill all of the zombies in this tunnel. Something about Joel's voice here. We killed him. It's like, okay, that was unrealistic, but we'll give you a break. Now we just need to get through this stint of water which quickly descends, tossing the pair around like a well-made misery cocktail. Joel is about to give Ellie CPR, but thankfully some Firefly soldiers are there to avoid any controversy. Joel wakes up in the Firefly base, and Marlene tells him the deal. Ellie has a special fungus growing around her brain. If they take that out, they can make a vaccine. Joel quickly picks up what she's putting down. They're gonna trade Ellie for a cure like she's a bad football player. And like a calm, rational person, Joel murders every single Firefly he sees to try and stop them. Marlene leaves and you have the entire hospital of trained killers between you and the person you care about. The theme of The Last of Us is love, and despite the violence, there's nothing more loving than putting yourself in this danger for someone you love. 
The hospital is cool as fuck because it has a visual relation with how Sarah died. It's set at the same time, deep into the night. Many of the enemies have flashlights, similar to the way Joel is cornered and the soldier is carrying a flashlight. And you might be like, that's a stupid stretch, but the only enemies in the game that carry flashlights are military. None of the bandits bother. It's like the game is saying that every single one of these guys could have been the same man that shot her. Even in that last moment of Joel sprinting with her, you pass an upside down ambulance. The enemies carry assault rifles and are covered in armor, so headshots don't work, and those flashlights pierce right through the smoke bombs. The enemies all cluster in this choke point too, so stealth is very difficult. I didn't have any problems in my hard mode run, but for shits and giggles, I tried again on survivor difficulty and oh, All of these rooms have like 10 openings in it, because windows don't need to have glass when they can be chest high walls instead. The combat in The Last of Us is not fun, per se. It's tense and emotionally satisfying. Like Doom is fun. You make so many decisions so quickly and you get a rush from it. But The Last of Us is about giving a small amount of flair with a handful of meaningful decisions, seeing the intricacies of those decisions and feeling engrossed in the environment. When I tried the game on Grounded or Survivor, my issues weren't with how quickly my health dropped, but in how I didn't know when I'd be fixing it. When the game gets harder, it doesn't always get more exciting. It can, but not in this part. With the high damage from the enemies and their numbers, they'll kill you in a flash. Because of the stuns on hit, you can't brute force anyone, leading to, well, using cheese. See, the AI has a quirk during stealth where it will send out a probe, a single dude to investigate your last location. So you designate that area as a safe zone and keep killing that single dude. It's less than the unbearing tide you'd have to face if you did it head on. Theoretically, you can pick people off as long as they approach you. They have all the angles covered, eliminating a basic stealth option. Unless you have the pathing matched out for the perfect big boss run, Joel also gets the final weapon in the game, an assault rifle, and it blows ass here. It has a lot of recoil and most of the soldiers have enough body armor to shrug it off. Thankfully it's accurate so you can use it for a single shot. Hold down the button and it's like you have vertical stick drift. And by the end of this playthrough I had both of those. I bought this PS5 for myself on Christmas and the controller has expired in 5 months. That's awesome. Fuck God of War Ragnarok, don't buy this thing. The first fight has a large series of rooms where you can sneak around and engage on your own terms. Asterisk on normal. While the second fight looks like Call of Duty. It's a straight gauntlet down the center with a lane to the right for you to get the funny kills. It's supposed to make the player feel like they've grown in power. As before, you couldn't even dare to take this many enemies. But now you have bombs for days and a fully upgraded shotgun. Bill kept that town safe with these and I wasn't going to lose faith in them now. And then we run into the last enemy in the game. A lone doctor threatening Joel with a scalpel. To which I retort with two revolver shots, one hunting pistol shot, a shotgun shell, half a mag of rifle rounds, an arrow for good luck, and five seconds of chemical hellfire. A lot of the conversation around the ending is based on the morality of it. Is it right to take away the cure to humankind to save one person? Was what Joel did right? No. Should he have done it anyway? Yeah. You could give everything to make the world a better place and it wouldn't say thank you. Instead, I want to talk about a scene that no one really discusses a whole lot. Joel killing Marlene. Now I get to finally blow off that creative writing degree that I'm pretty sure I dropped out of. Joel executing her to most people looks like a cold final moment of badassery by a man that doesn't take shit. I see it as an inversion of the game's opening. Every character in the game's biggest loss is from the cordyceps. Ellie loses Riley to a bite, Tess gets bitten and would rather die a warrior's death, Bill loses Frank after he gets bitten and chooses not to turn, Sam gets infected and Henry can't live with what just happened, Joel's biggest loss was from a soldier following orders. The infection didn't take Sarah from him. People did. Him in this fucked up world where the only way people can find comfort is with a fistful of powder. Marlene even holds up her hand for mercy like Joel did. Marlene postured about having gone through the same loss, but the difference between her and Joel is that she can't love like he does. Joel lost one person and it marked his entire life. Marlene's a military leader. She sees people die every day. She doesn't have time to form attachments to them. It would go against her job. She's the antithesis of Joel, so she pays the price for it. I've always been a bit disappointed in the lack of analysis with Marlene. Not in that I can't see why. She appears at the start and end of the game. The game was never meant to have a large villain. It's more of a man versus world story. I mean, I can't even really tell you who Marlene is. Meanwhile, the ethics of what Joel did, that's more philosophical. You can think about what you would have done. Okay.
This is the ending of The Last of Us. Joel takes a car from the base and takes Ellie home. By home, it's Tommy's home. There's nothing left to say or do. This section you play as Ellie, it's a few minutes of contextual interactions and walking. Joel lies to her and tells her that there are plenty of immune people, that the Fireflies have been trying for a while and given up on a cure. Ellie says, do you promise that's true? And Joel says he swears. And she just says, okay. Cuts to black. That's basically it. And when you say it like that, it's kind of lame, right? Like you walk a bit, Joel lies, you say okay, lay epic acoustic guitar. Then I heard this line in Left Behind, and I thought it was kind of interesting. They've asked me to leave. Leave what? Boston. Okay. That's it? Well, what do you want me to say? I don't know. How about some friendly advice? <laughs> Ellie needs Joel. She can't just turn around and die in the wilderness. But also, Ellie wants to trust him. He is this beacon of stability. Someone who always knows what to do and would protect her from how awful the world is. Yet there is a distrust in her. In her mind, she was in a tunnel, then in Joel's car. Everything she was building to in her head just anticlimactically skipped. The story of her immunity ended on a cliffhanger. What can Ellie say to Joel here? She can't accuse him of lying because it wouldn't do anything. And it's just easier to surrender herself to a good life with the people she loves. As for Joel, there's nothing left to say anymore. He's got what he wanted. He has a chance to live out the rest of his life with his family. It's a perfect recreation of the opening, where he started the game as one of his daughters to the other. And yes, I did need to bring up Left Behind earlier just to make this one inference. The Last of Us has narrative parallels everywhere, and its writing is still fun even if you're not looking for them. I don't even know how much of my interpretation is right. Maybe I'm Mr. Fantastic stretching for wild Matt Pat theories. As for that trailer, well, doesn't really matter. It's a pretty trailer, and it lied about a pretty experience. Yet, on the other hand, I can kind of see why this sort of thing is good for a trailer and not for an actual game. There are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 26. 26 shootouts. Like, how many times can you hear, He's got a gun! He's got a gun! Yeah, I've got a lot of guns. All of those atmospheric things that didn't make into the game, they made it into The Last of Us Part 2. And everyone looked at all those features and said, Yeah, okay, that sounds pretty good. Then the rest of it, they said, No, thank you. Except me. I said yes, please. We'll save that for another video, though. I don't want to ruin our rapport just yet. I'm a nice guy. I guess I'll end this. Is The Last of Us the best game of all time? Honestly, no. I told you at the start, that doesn't exist. I know that's a cop-out answer, but what do you want me to say? It's a detailed world that is gorgeous, but there are probably more stylized games out there that appeal to certain individuals. The combat is tense, but maybe you want to feel excited and energetic. The characters are down to earth and interesting, but sometimes you want to genuinely laugh. Though also, Craig Mazin isn't trying to take that away from you, and neither are the people saying that. The Last of Us Part 1's reputation is just a culmination of general public approval, mixed with the insane amounts of money that ooze from every one of its corners. And that's awesome! It's sick that we got something this well-funded and quality-focused in a world of increasingly scummy media. The Last of Us is the best The Last of Us of all time. It's a simple answer, I know, but I think it's okay not to classify things like that. No, I don't have any counter-arguments, but I brought this! Hey, thanks for watching. I gotta be honest, this is a bit of a weird one. I was originally only planning to make a quick 15 minute video on it, but then I replayed it and realized just how obsessed I actually am with it. Before I start to ramble about this video, I'd like to thank the people on Patreon who made it possible. I would especially like to thank MarioFan997, MyRead, Hatchet, Jonah Simpson, Sir Coffee, Axera, Faye Lin, and Auker. This video ended up being very different than I originally planned. At the start, I just wanted to make a quick 15 minute video since I knew a lot about it. But then as I started to replay the game, the more I realized that I'm uh, obsessed with it. A lot of the footage started to speak for itself, so I opted for less jumpy editing. That said, I tried to add some special flair to it where I could. Thank you for watching. Hopefully the next video comes out and I don't need to stress about it too much. And uh, thank you so much for sticking around just to see the end of the credits.